Well, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thanks for joining, or good morning, good evening, depending on where you are, but welcome to our webinar here at Rodell Institute. Uh, this is going to be our research update with our um, swine parasite project that we've had going on for the last three years. Um, it's titled Organic Control Strategies for Swine Parasites and Organic Pasture Pork Systems. Um, my name is Rick Carr. I'm the farm director at Rodale Institute. I've been with this project since uh, we first started it in 2017, 2018. Eight, 2018. Join with me is Sarah Major and Bear, Baylor Lansden. Uh, they're going to be uh, presenting on this project. Uh, in fact, I'm going to have uh, Sarah do a bunch of the uh, parasite related um, discussion and the data she's presenting there. And Baylor, he is going to be presenting on how we actually run a uh, pastured pork operation. But I also want to um, acknowledge our collaborators at Kutztown University and University of Minnesota, Dr. Uh, Alex Hernandez and Dr. Yuchi Lee. Uh, they are very instrumental in uh, the success of this project. So I, I, I want to acknowledge them from the, uh, um, from the beginning. All right, so with that, uh, some um, housekeeping uh, uh, items. Um, uh, there's going to be q and a, Q a uh, question and answers at the end of this presentation. We'll have we'll certainly save plenty of time for that. Um, and what you can do is in on the zoom, you could there's a chat feature, uh, depending on how your computer set up, it's either at the top or the bottom. Uh, you click on that chat and please type in any questions that you have during the uh, presentation and we will address them at the end of the presentation. So as I said, uh, um, I'm Rick Carr, I'm the farm director. I've been with Rodale Institute for uh, since 2013, uh, initially hired as the compost production specialist. We do have a composting component to our research here. Uh, that I will be presenting a little later, uh, but I'm going to allow uh, Sarah to introduce herself, followed by Baylor. Go ahead, Sarah. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Sarah Major. I'm a research technician at Rodale, um, and I have been working on this project since I was an undergrad at Kutztown University, um, and I came on as a full-time employee in November of 2019. Thank you, Sarah. Baylor? Hello, I'm Baylor Lanston. I am the livestock tech here at Rodale Institute. So I work daily with the livestock that we're gonna be talking about today. Um, I started here in 2019 as an intern and then stuck around because I liked it so much. <laughs> Thanks, Baylor. All right, guys, are we ready to go? Yeah, I just wanna mention um, to use the Q&A feature and not the chat feature to ask questions. My mistake, thank you. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> that makes more sense. <laughs> All right, yes, definitely use that Q&A feature, which is right next to the chat. Um, so with that, we're gonna get going and we're gonna turn off our uh, video so we can make sure that quality is good. All right, go ahead, Sarah, I'll let you take over. All right. Oh, Baylor, sorry, go ahead. All oh, good. I'm actually going to start us off just to um, contextualize some of Sarah's work. So I wanted to talk first about why we even put pigs on pasture. So as y'all may be aware, um, the vast, vast majority of pigs are raised in confinement in the United States. Um, so putting pigs on pasture is a little different, but I wanted to explain a little bit why. So first off is improved animal welfare. Um, pigs outside don't experience the same overcrowding as pigs raised in confinement, as well as they get to exhibit a lot of natural behaviors. Disease reduction is a possibility with pigs on pasture because of an increased um, level of immune response or a heightened um, immune system um, just because of increased um, nutrition as well as increased welfare. Reduced feed costs is a possibility with pasture-raised hogs um, because some of the diet that's brought in can be supplemented with um, pasture. More nutritious pork for um, the human consuming the animal. Pigs on pasture generally have higher omega-3s as well as potentially higher vitamin E, A, and D. All right, so 
One of the possible negatives that come along with pasture-raised pork is that they have a greater likelihood of coming into contact with parasites um, which live in the soil, which Sarah will explain more further. So we chose to investigate this problem uh, because these parasites can reduce the growth rate and feed conversion of the pigs, as well as unfortunately cause death if um, there's a severe infection. This results in losses for the farmers as they have to buy more feed for pound of gain or possibly may lose an animal completely. There was little scientific research on organic approved parasite management and deworming, um, which is very important in our context since we are trying to go all the way and produce organic pasture raised hogs. Um, so there was also um, no chemical dewormers allowed in organic growing pigs. Um, so we were trying to find an alternative, which is what led us into the research that Sarah will now take over. Thank you, Baylor. Um, first, I'm gonna go into um, the three parasite species that we um, have found most often doing our research. Um, first, we have worms in the species Ossifagostomum, um, which are the nodular worms. Um, first, I'm gonna go over the life cycle. So um, eggs are passed in the feces and over the course of about a week, depending on the temperature, um, larvae hatch from those eggs. Um, and in the environment, they undergo two molts to become L3 or third stage larva. If those L3 larvae are ingested, they go to the large intestine where the larvae burrow into the wall of the intestine to complete development. Um, when they're fully developed, they emerge from um, the wall of the intestine and the adults live and reproduce in the lumen or opening of the large intestine. The pre-patent period, which is the period between when an infective stage is ingested and when eggs become detectable in the feces is 20 to 40 days. A little bit more about the nodular worm. Larvae burrowing in the intestinal wall can leave nodules of scar tissue, um, and this results in the intestines being condemned at slaughter. The infective larvae can survive on pasture for about a year. Um, the worms are pretty small. Adults only grow up to be about three centimeters in length, and the female Ossifagostomum worms can lay around 5,000 eggs per day. Most infections with Ossifagostomum are asymptomatic. However, heavy infections can cause diarrhea, reduced weight gain, and poor feed efficiency. Pigs only develop a moderate immune response to Ossifagostomum infections, so reinfection is pretty um, common. Next, we have Ascarosuum, which is the large intestinal roundworm. Once again, the eggs are passed in the feces, and um, over the course of around two to six weeks, depending on temperature, um, an L2 or second stage larva develops in the egg. That is the infective stage, so if an infective egg is ingested, uh, that larva hatches in the small intestine. From the small intestine, the larvae travel to the liver through the bile duct, to the lungs via the circulatory or lymphatic vessels, and when they're finished in the lungs, um, they either travel up the pharynx and back down the esophagus, or um, are coughed up and swallowed. And from there, they end up back in the small intestine where the adult worms live and reproduce. Um, it's believed that they go through this process, um, going through the liver and the lungs to avoid um, the, immune, the immune system while they're still undergoing development. And the pre-patent period, which once again is the period between when the infection begins and when eggs begin to be um, passed in the feces is 40 to 50 days. The larvae traveling through the liver um, can result in scar tissue granulomas or milk spots, um, which results in those livers being condemned at slaughter. Um, and this can result in yet another economic loss for farmers. The eggs of Ascarosuum can remain viable in the soil for up to 11 years, um, and adult worms can live in the large intestine for, or I'm sorry, the small intestine for six to nine months. Adult female worms grow up to 40 centimeters or about 16 inches, and males are smaller, grow up to um, 25 centimeters or around 10 inches. And female Ascarosuum worms lay around 200,000 eggs per day. Infections with Ascarosuum can cause poor weight gain, diarrhea, pneumonia, and intestinal blockages. And pigs have 
some immunity um, to Ascarosuum, so reinfection is possible, but not as common as it is for Ossipogostomum. And finally, we have Trichurisuus, which is the swine whipworm. Once again, eggs are passed in the feces um, over the course of 15 to 30 days. Um, an L1 or first stage larva develops in the egg, and this is the infective stage. So if one of those eggs is ingested, it hatches in the large intestine um, where the larva undergoes development um, and becomes an adult worm. The adult worms attach the mucosal lining um, and feed off of secretions and blood from the in, uh, lining of the intestine, and that is where they live and reproduce. The prepatent period for Trichurisuis is 60 to 70 days. Um, Trichurisuis eggs can remain viable for three to four years in the soil. Um, adult female worms grow between five and eight centimeters in length, and males are generally around half that size. Um, the adult worms can live for four to five months, and female worms can lay five to 20,000 eggs per day. Heavy infections can cause anorexia, anemia, bloody diarrhea, dehydration, and death in severe cases. Luckily, pigs have an effective immune response to Trichurisuis, so um, Trichurisuis infections usually don't last um, those four to five months, and reinfection with Trichurisuis is rare. Um, so next we're going to be talking about our USDA NEPA Organic Dr Transitions grant funded project titled Manure and Pasture Management to Reduce Swine Parasites in Organic Pastured Pork Production. As we mentioned at the beginning, um, we are doing this project in collaboration with Dr. Yushi Lee at the University of Minnesota and Dr. Alex Hernandez at Kutztown University. The grant started um, in October of 2018 and will be completed September 30th of 2022. Our grant funded project had four objectives. The first was to evaluate parasite prevalence on organic pig farms. Second, we wanted to determine the effectiveness of manure composting on eliminating swine parasites and its underlying mechanisms. And um, the third and fourth objectives focused on biofumigation. So the third objective was to assess biofumigation as an approach to swine parasite control in pastures. And the fourth objective was to determine the effects of grazing biofumigation pastures by organic pigs on reducing swine parasite contamination. So for research objective one, which once again was to evaluate the parasite prevalence on organic pig farms, um, we did a farm survey um, and collected samples from nine different farms in Wisconsin, Iowa, Minnesota, and Pennsylvania. We chose these four states because they are home to about 30% of the nation's organic pig farms and are the source of about 60% of the national organic pork sales. Criteria for farms to be um, used in our study was that the farm had to be either organic or follow organic practices and the pigs had to have outdoor access. Um, the floors that the pigs resided on had to be bedded, um, the, no slatted floors or confinement was allowed, and the farms could not use any synthetic or non-organically approved dewormers. Um, on these nine farms, we collected fecal bedding and soil samples, and the fecal samples that we collected from pigs were separated into categories based on the pig's age. Um, we collected from breeding sows um, of all parodies, feeder to growing pigs were um, pigs that uh, piglets between weaning and about four months of age, and finishing pigs, which were five months of, five months of age uh, to finishing. Um, before I go into our results, I just want to go over some terminology that I'm going to be using. Um, prevalence is the proportion of infected individuals among all individuals examined. Um, this is usually reported as a percentage. Mean intensity is the average number of parasite individuals in an infected host and mean abundance is the average number of parasite individuals in all hosts. So abundance uses um, all hosts that are examined, even uninfected individuals, and mean abundance combines prevalence and mean intensity. To give an example of this, if we had four pigs that we were sampling, one had five parasites, one had three parasites, one had zero parasites, and one had four parasites, three out of those four pigs had parasites, so the prevalence was three out of four or 75%. There are 12 total worms in the system and three infected hosts, so the mean intensity would be four, and the mean abundance would be 12 parasite individuals among four hosts, so the mean abundance would be three. First, we have a graph of the prevalence of parasite infections by farm and state, and the main point that I want to 
um, derived from this graph is that every single farm that we sampled had parasites um, infections. And eight out of the nine farms that we sampled had a prevalence of greater than 50%. So um, all but one of the farms had at least half of their pigs that we sampled um, infected with at least one parasite species. Next, we have the prevalence of infections by parasite species. And from this, we can see that Ascarosuum was the most prevalent parasite with a, a prevalence of around 45% or 45% of pigs that we sampled had infection, had an Ascarosuum infection. Um, and Ossogostomum and Trichurosuus had around the same prevalence of about 25%. Next, we have the prevalence of infections by host age group and parasite species. So this is breaking it down a little more. Um, the blue bars represent feeder pigs, which again are those um, newly weaned piglets up to about four months of age. The uh, green bars are finisher pigs, um, which are five months until slaughter. And um, the blue green color are breeders. Um, so from this, we can see that finisher pigs um, had the highest prevalence and feeders were close behind, and breeders were most often um, infected with either Ossipagostomum or Ascarosuum. Here we have a graph of the mean intensity of parasite infection in different pig age groups by parasite species. Um, again, intensity is the average number of um, parasite individuals within an infected host. Um, we can see that Ascarosuum had a significantly higher intensity um, than the other two parasite species, but this is to be expected because, as I mentioned, Ascarosuum can release 200,000 eggs per day, um, whereas the other two species can only release between 5,000 and 20,000 eggs per day. Um, and we measured intensity by using um, the calculated eggs per gram of feces. Um, so, as I just mentioned, um, we used eggs per gram of feces as an indicator for the intensity of an infection, um, whereas in parasitology, it's generally, um, they generally use the number of actual parasite individuals to calculate intensity. Um, so to find out if this is an accurate substitute, or in other words, to determine whether or not there is a direct correlation between the number of eggs in the feces and the number of worms within an infected individual, we flushed intestines of slaughtered pigs and compared the number of worms within those intestines with um, the calculated eggs per gram of rectal feces collected from the intestines. Um, so first, uh, you can see a graph of um, the number of worms recovered from the intestines of Ossophagostomum uh, versus the fecal egg count in eggs per gram of feces um, for Ossophagostomum. And there wasn't a very close relationship between um, the number of worms recovered and the eggs per gram of feces. Um, and there is literature that supports this, so um, this was expected. Next, we have a graph of Ascarosuum, which had a much closer relationship um, between the number of worms recovered and the fecal egg count. Um, however, you can see those two outliers where um, there was a low number of worms with a really high EPG, which can also be explained by some literature findings that um, female Ascarosuum worms um, can have more eggs when they are in an environment with fewer um, worms. So essentially, um, a female Ascarosuum will have more eggs if there are fewer Ascarosuum um, individuals in that intestine along with her, whereas in a more heavily infected individual, those Ascarosuum female worms will um, contain fewer eggs. And finally, we have Trichurosuus, and we saw a very close relationship between the number of worms recovered and the fecal egg count. However, we also had a much smaller um, sample size for this. So um, from these results, we can say that um, there is a relatively direct correlation between the number of worms recovered and the fecal egg count. So our um, substitution of fecal egg count for the number of worms is um, pretty direct. However, we can't make that same claim for Ossophagostomum. And next, Rick Carr is going to be um, discussing our research objective too. Thank you, Sarah. And what I like about this project a lot is when she gives her presentation, the graphic nature of, of what these parasites can do to these pigs. Sounds like you're reading 
Oh, side effects from some drug, some new drug. Okay, uh, compost, probably the hottest topic of, of, of all of this, and I'll show in just a, a minute or so with uh, some of the temperature data that we have. Um, but anyway, so uh, to um, the manure management, typical practices, you take that manure and you spread it into the field, uh, onto you, the, whether it's an existing pasture or something you're gonna turn into uh, for corn production or some grain production, and then you might transition, transition back into a pasture where the pigs are gonna go on that uh, again. But what we already know is that some of these uh, parasites, the eggs can survive in the environment for seven to 10 years. And we are actually preliminary data that uh, Sarah and I have been collecting as we put pigs into a field that did not have any pigs on it before. And we were not able to detect the parasites in that field beforehand. And we rotated them through the field for one litter, I guess it would have about six months worth uh, in time. And now we're sampling that field every year. And so far, correct me if I'm wrong, we have detected it every year. And that's three years going. Uh, so taking your manure and just um, spreading into a field, um, you could be recontaminating whatever litter or pigs that are going back into that field for, um, for foraging. So instead, let's compost this. For me, this was low hanging fruit. We know already that we can compost um, um, any diseased plant material, any meat uh, uh, with human pathogens on it. We could compost that. As, assuming we're achieving high enough temperatures, we can destroy all the unwanted um, disease causing organisms, as well as any weed seeds. Um, basically it's, you're in a, in a way pasteurizing it, getting it free of any disease causing um, organisms. So this was low hanging fruit for me. Let's take that uh, bed pack manure. As Baylor said, that that's how we have our pigs. And I think there are some uh, um, images of that. We have the bed pack manure that goes into a windrow that you can see here. And then we manage it with this uh, compost turner here, the Sittler compost turner. Uh, we do that for all of our uh, waste materials we generate here on the farm, whether it's gonna be plant material or from our animal production. And so for this, we take that straight bed pack manure and we compost that and we're recording the temperatures using I buttons um, that are digital data loggers that I could download later. Okay, so for the methodology, uh, the samples are collected before we start composting, before that first turn, and then we do it weekly for eight weeks during the composting period. The National Organic Program has rules and regulations for being able to um, um, spread compost or create compost. And it really only applies to any animal-based products. Um, so either the mortality composting or manures. And uh, what their rule says is if you want to spread compost without restriction um, on fields that are gonna be used for human consumption or uh, then you have to meet a time temperature rule and that's 131 to 170 degrees Fahrenheit for 15 consecutive days, during which time you must turn it a minimum of five times. So, and doing that after the 15 days, the composting is, is certainly not finished. You're composting it for several months uh, beyond the 15 days, but that's what they've been able to previously detect uh, in early studies in the 90s that um, if you do those, if you meet that rule, then you're able to destroy um, E. coli. And really this is, th these rules are put in place for human pathogens, but there's no reason to suggest that it can't work for other pathogens, plant pathogens, animal pathogens. So what I'm gonna show you here is, uh, this is the time and temperature data that we've collected from these piles. Um, you're looking at uh, on the left side, you can see the date there, that's uh, January 10th starting going into February. Uh, so that's the winter trial. Uh, for this project, um, we needed enough compost to generate so that it could be turned with our turning system. Ideally, Baylor would like to 
clean the hog facility more often, but we are currently just cleaning it twice a year. There's a summer clean out and a winter clean out. And we do generate a lot more material during the winter because we're bedding more often uh, for the animal sake and they're going outside less, uh, but they do have full-time access. So we do a uh, summer clean out and that's what's on the right. Um, we do a summer clean out. It's gonna be a little less material, but it's still enough for me to compost. Uh, using our turner. Okay, so what they, these, both of these graphs are showing, the black line is the actual average pile temperature. There's six probes that are put into each pile. And those red dots that you see in the black line are the, the turning events, uh, days that I went out and turned it. Uh, and so you can easily notice and detect when I turned it because um, more times than not, af right after uh, a turning event, you're going to see a drop in temperature. Uh, it could be either because I pulled the probe out and it's just re responding to the ambient air, but our probes are recording every four hours. So it's to be expected, but um, in nearly all cases, temperature comes right back within 12 hours. Okay, so the big difference here is that you see on the left, it's the winter, it's 60 degrees uh, Celsius here. Um, so we're, we're reaching high temperatures, uh, 60 degrees Celsius is going to be along the lines of like, I think 140 ish. Um, but on the other side, we're reaching well above the 131 degrees, which is going to be a 55 degrees Celsius. And we're, we're maintaining that temperature. Uh, during the winter, it's much more difficult to maintain those temperatures with a small pile that we are producing from the hog facility. Uh, so it was more difficult. And then you could see the, um, the ambient air temperatures, the gray line uh, that's below all of that. So you see the daily fluctuations in that gray line. Um, so during the winter, it was freezing temperatures for most of the early part of this composting process, while it was, um, you know, warm temperatures, summer temperatures here uh, that you can see there. So what I'm going to show you next is then how does that temperature, um, how do the swine parasites respond to the temperatures in the composting process? Uh, so what you're looking at here is uh, a log mean of the parasite eggs that we had uh, measured and detected uh, through sampling. Uh, you see some great variability. But uh, on the left, um, with the winter trial, it's pretty clear that um, the composting didn't have much of an impact uh, on, um, on destroying these parasite eggs. However, during the summer, when we can maintain those temperatures and we are able to actually destroy them, and you can see with the uh, Ostophagostomum that within one week, we were no, not able to detect them and a significant decrease in, in um, parasite egg detection with uh, the uh, Ascaris and Tricaris. Uh, can't really explain right now, but we didn't see much change over time with that one. Uh, so that was a winter and summer trial. We've been repeating that uh, each year and we're gonna be doing it again this winter. And so here's what it looks like again when we repeated it, um, the uh, winter on the left, summer on the right, and you can see that in the uh, temperature data there. Um, what's kind of funny to see is uh, in February of this year, we had one of our largest snowstorms uh, that we've had on record for um, as long as I could remember. Uh, but that happened right, I don't know if you could see my mouse, but it happened right around uh, uh, February 16th. And at that point, we weren't able to turn because it was covered with close to 18 inches of snow. And so that's what happened there. And at that point, composting pretty much went down to uh, the active composting was uh, negligible. And you can see it's uh, the actual pile is mirroring the, um, the ambient air temperature. But in the summer, just like the last one, we were able to sustain those high temperatures uh, for a longer period of time. And what that's gonna look like um, in the parasite data is what you see here, similar on the left is gonna be the winter trial and then the summer trial. And so again, um, 
we have uh, Scaris that's surviving through for several weeks, several months, um, surviving in the pile that we're able to detect. I had Sarah collect it. You see that extended graph there. I had Sarah go out in just before and just say maybe there's other things that are um, that are operating. Could be uh, biological destruction, some other bacterium is releasing a toxin. Let's just detect it for a longer period of time, not just the eight weeks. And still she was able to uh, detect the Ascaris in the compost pile. But that wasn't the same story with the summer trial. And you can see a significant drop off within uh, a few weeks. And uh, even measuring out, we were no longer able to detect uh, any parasites. And we are suspecting that temperature is gonna have a role. Right now we do have some uh, incubation trials in the laboratory to determine does temperature uh, have a role? Is that what's operating? Yeah, there we go. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so we have these bioassays ongoing right now and still uh, working on that data. And we'll be able to share that with you next year. So please check back uh, on that. Um, because uh, from my experience, it might not just be temperature. It could be, and we know this from um, human pathogens, it could be from antibiosis from uh, other organisms that are operating in the pile. All right, uh, objective three, I'm gonna pass this off to Sarah again. Take it away, Sarah. Thanks, Rick. Um, so objective three is um, dealing with biofumigation. Um, the objective was to assess biofumigation as an approach to swine parasite control in pastures. Um, I just want to mention that this is um, this was done in pastures where pigs were not present. Um, and biofumigation is the use of naturally occurring chemicals from plants to control pests in soil. Um, farmers generally use biofumigation to destroy um, plant pathogens, um, plant parasites, and soil nematodes. Um, but it's never been studied for its use against swine parasites. Um, for biofumigation, um, plants that are used are generally in the brassica family, and that is because brassicas have um, a chemical called glucosinol glucosinolates, um, and when the plant experience experiences tissue damage, um, they produce a gas called isothiocyanate. Isothiocyanate is a derivative of cyanide gas. Um, it's a highly toxic volatile gas. So it, um, when it's released, it destroys pests in the soil, but it evaporates really quickly. Um, and for objective three, we wanted to test um, yellow mustard and rapeseed, which are both brassicas, um, and compare them to ladino clover um, as a control. So. Uh, when we first tested it, we planted fields of um, ladino clover, rapeseed, and yellow mustard. We waited for a stain of yellow mustard, artificially inoculated the fields with fresh pig feces, and in that fresh pig feces, we had done fecal egg counts um, to get an approximate um, eggs per gram of feces, so we were able to calculate approximately how many eggs we were introducing to the field. Um, then those fields were mowed with a flail mower, rototilled down six to eight inches, and cultipacked. Um, and then those fields were soil sampled for four weeks. Unfortunately, after doing this trial, um, we weren't able to de detect any eggs in the pasture despite having spread um, a very significant number of eggs in the fields. So to um, adjust our methodology and to try to get some results from that, we are doing trials in a greenhouse. Um, and we're following approximately the same methodology, just on a smaller scale. Um, so this is ongoing right now at Cookstown University. Um, we planted the plants in pots. And once again, we are waiting for a stand of yellow mustard, artificially inoculating those pots with fresh swine feces. And then the plants will be trimmed by hand to mimic uh, mowing with the flail mower, manually mixing into the soil and packing um, again with the hand and then weekly soil sampling those pots for four weeks. So as I mentioned, this is ongoing. Um, we don't currently have any results from that, but um, we will have an update next year. And finally, we have research objective four, which was to determine the, the effects of grazing those biofumigation pastures by organic pigs on reducing the swine parasite contamination. 
So in addition to um, testing rapeseed and its abilities to destroy the swine parasites, we're also comparing mechanical versus what we call biological incorporation of the plant residues. Um, so in addition to um, mechanically mowing, spading, um, and incorporating those plant materials and packing it, um, we're also looking at um, the pigs using their natural behaviors of foraging and trampling the plant materials um, and whether or not that's enough to um, release those gases and trap them in the soil long enough to have an effect. So our experimental design is basically we have four fields, two clover fields and two rapeseed fields. The clover fields are C1 and C2 and rapeseed fields are R1 and R2. And this is a map of our hog facility. Um, those four pastures are the location of our first trial. We're currently in the middle of our third trial for objective three. Um, and each field is split into four paddocks and the groups of pigs are um, grazed on each paddock for one week. Um, after the pigs are taken off, um, C1 and R1 were mechanically incorporated into the soil. So once again, we flail mode, um, rototilled and cultipacked those fields and C2 and R2 were not mechanically incorporated into the soil. So um, those represented that biological incorporation. Our first trial, um, similar to objective three, we weren't able to detect any um, parasite eggs in the soil. So um, the results were inconclusive. For our second trial, which took place this past summer, um, we tried to reduce the size of the fields and therefore the size of, of the pastures to more densely graze the paddocks um, and to ideally spread more pears, um, parasite infected manure onto those paddocks. Um, and again, C1 and R1 were mechanically incorporated into the soil and C2 and R2 were not mechanically incorporated, but were rather incorporated by the pigs. Um, this data is still being analyzed, but we will have an update next year. And we are, um, as I mentioned in our third trial, um, we again have those smaller fields um, to more densely graze the pigs um, and so far, we're getting pretty promising results. Um, so hopefully we'll have some good data to share next year. Thank you for watching. Um, and now we're gonna open it up to any questions. I think uh, what we could also say is what we're gonna do in the future. Uh, we have lots of research ideas. This uh, swine parasite investigations is, is ongoing and there's just a tremendous amount of questions that are left unanswered when it comes to pastured pork. We know in confinement operations where they're using uh, medications and um, um, anti-parasitic uh, treatments that they don't have this project uh, problem, but in pastured pork, uh, organic systems, um, there are no solutions for it. And that's what prompted us to start this research. So I could say that um, the uh, the team here and um, in um, in Minnesota and Kutztown, um, we're always talking about what what's the next project. How can we build off of this? And um, one of them that Sarah's been doing and she's going to keep doing is just understanding kind of the biology of these um, these parasites. I and mean, we're collecting parasite we're collecting uh, fecal samples from pigs all the time. Uh, is there a seasonality to infection? Why do some pigs get infected and others do not? Um, you might have a litter of pigs, nine of them are infected, but one isn't. Is there a threshold to the infection where uh, those symptoms that Sarah mentioned, all of our pigs might be infected, but only one showing uh, symptoms? And uh, so we're trying to understand that kind of, of, of information and, and collect that data as we move into the future. I know there was also discussions on, um, is it, uh, is, are there behavioral changes when pigs become infected? Can we detect that? Uh, Alex uh, Hernandez, he had done lots of uh, studies in that or uh, in, in investigating those questions. Um, what other stuff am I missing, Sarah or Baylor? Um, we definitely want to look into um, some rumored um, natural or and organically approved dewormers. Um, as we mentioned, there's not a lot of scientific research done on those. Um, so it would be awesome to be able to do some um, well-managed and 
organized um, research projects for those. Um, we may do another um, uh, larger survey of more farms um, to get a better idea of um, the how widespread um, parasite infections are um, in pastured pork production systems. Yeah, reach out to uh, more states. You know, what what is the severity of this problem? Is you know just a natural direction that we're going to take this project. Um, but we're still, you know, we're still at the round table discussing it. We do know that farmers, this is a leading issue for farmers or a concern, I should say. And my first um, experience into swine parasite management is at a round table discussion at um, a conference, a grower, a farmer conference. And I stood up having, you know, some knowledge of, of, of pig production just from what I was uh, watching here at Rodale and uh, experiencing uh, myself that stood up and said, listen, I've tried to research uh, uh, these simple questions of, you know, just even pastured pork production in general. Do, um, how, how, do we know all these simple questions like um, how much pastures does a pig eat? and what pastures preferred, uh, what uh, swine parasite treatments uh, is everybody using. And unanimously, the farmers, the extension agents, and some of the scientists, they said, yeah, we really don't know any of that information. So that, that said, all right, well, I know what I'm going to write a project on because it's low-hanging fruit. Everybody knows this is a problem. Nobody's researching it. And anything we discover is going to be novel information. Um, so yeah, that's where we're at now. And I see we have a question here. So you wanna, you read that up? What about the, uh, from West, um, what about the effect of multi-species grazing? Do the parasites persist in other livestock? Is it possible to integrate other grazers, foragers to act as a, a cleanup crew, such as chickens to lessen the prevalence? So I'm going to let you take that, and Baylor and I could also comment um, how we would like to answer it. But go ahead, Sarah. Yeah, um, a lot of farmers will do multi-species grazing, um, but parasites tend to be pretty host-specific. Um, unlike ruminants like cows and sheep, um, pigs are monogastric like humans, um, which just means they only have one stomach. So um, if a cow is grazed on a pasture that has um, pig parasite eggs in it, that cow will not pick up those parasites. Um, and similarly, chicken digestive systems are very different from a pig digestive system. So if chickens are grazed on that same field, um, they will not pick up an infection. Um, if they ingest any eggs, the eggs will just simply not become um, an adult worm. However, um, there is a really high number of eggs out in the pastures when a pig is infected. Um, as I mentioned, Ascaris can release 200,000 eggs per day, and that's just one worm. Um, and so a pig who is infected with Ascaris suum is releasing hundreds of thousands or millions of eggs um, throughout the course of this infection. So the chances that um, just grazing that pasture with a different animal um, the chances are that that animal is not going to completely get rid of all of the eggs in the pasture. Um, additionally, the eggs are microscopic, so um, no other livestock is able to see them. They're not going to consciously try to um, destroy them or get rid of them in any way. So any that they pick up and um, get rid of is just basically by luck. Yeah, that, that is something that I hear farmers um, try to, I guess, uh, manage their parasites is that yeah chickens are they eating them now these are microscopic eggs that you can't see it's not like chickens going out there and they could see small seeds and consciously pick them up uh, but you know, really these a chicken's not going to be doing that um, before we get there's another question Sarah why don't you tell how do these parasites impact human health so if I consume a infected pig What's that going to do for humans? Um, so all of these 
um, parasites are gastrointestinal parasites, which just means that they only infect the intestines of the pigs. Um, so none of the meat of the pigs is um, impacted by these infections. Um, the only way that it impacts the meatiness of a pig is just by, again, reducing that growth rate and that um, feed efficiency. So pigs have a harder time growing to finishing weight um, when they have heavy parasite infections, but their meat is not otherwise impacted. Yeah, it's kind of the question that the anonymous attendee is asking, how uh, have the parasites impacted the marketability of your organic hogs? Um, were most of the infected pigs symptomatic? Uh, so Sarah did say something of that, and I'll let Baylor actually comment on uh, that question. If he wants to add anything. Sure, yeah. Um, the, as to the marketability, it has not affected the marketability of our hogs because as Sarah was just saying, um, it does not affect the meat of the animals. Um, as to the infected pigs being symptomatic, um, I guess, well, uh, most of the pigs were not symptomatic because all of our pigs are infected. Um, however, we have had pigs that show symptoms um, and we also have lost pigs to parasites. Um, so yes, definitely we have had symptomatic infections. And we're, we're not entirely clear just because we don't have the capacity to measure some of the stuff, but uh, Baylor, wouldn't you agree that some of our heavily infected symptomatic pigs also develop other conditions? Is that true? Um, we haven't seen that, I don't believe. Um, I think it's pretty, um, it's very possible for those pigs to develop um, secondary bacterial infections. Yes. Um, so we've had Weaken pigs immune who, system that you can get that. Yeah, so yeah. we've had pigs who um, had heavy worm infections, which we confirmed with fecal egg counts, um, and they were chemically dewormed, um, which made them not el eligible to be um, organic product, but we wanted to ensure the welfare of our pigs. Um, and even after being chemically dewormed, um, they had secondary bacterial infections that um, ended up causing them to pass away or have to be put down. Okay. Um, West, I think you covered it, but how long are the eggs viable in the soil? Would extended resting periods of pastures change their viability? And I'll quickly answer, and um, Sarah can chime in, uh, how long are they viable in soil? We've done um, our own research into that and it's still ongoing. But that has also been documented with previous studies. And so um, I think that the, uh, a lot of the papers I read, some of them said four to five years, but there was one article that said uh, you could detect these parasite eggs in the soil for seven to 10 years. Uh, what we've seen here, uh, where they, we put them on a pasture that they um, had access to, um, and they, no pigs had previously uh, had access to that pasture. And now we're measuring each year before any field activities occur. And that's been going on for, this is the third year this year. And we've been growing other grains on that. Right now it's corn. And so we're turning over the field for corn. And so three years going, we're detecting parasites, the eggs every year. Um, you wanna add anything? Um, yeah. Um, Ascarasuum definitely persists on the pasture the longest out of the parasite species that we've um, covered. Um, and once again, those female worms can release 200,000 eggs per day and can live for a few months. So um, those eggs, possibly millions of eggs are out on a pasture and certainly not all of them will remain viable for those um, 10 years, but um, what about Ophisphagosmum? Sorry. Um, Ophisphagosmum hatches on pasture, so those larvae can persist on pasture for about a year. So, um, if a pasture was allowed to rest with no pigs on it whatsoever for a whole year, um, the chances of Ophisphagosmum being in that system are much lower. However, Trichurosuus and Ascarosuum eggs can um, certainly still be viable in that um, pasture. So. Just allowing the pasture to rest is not really um, a significantly reliable method of controlling parasites. 
All right, next question from Anonymous. Uh, wild pigs in Michigan, other states problem. Do we know parasite loads in them? Any resistance or kill them from pest infection? Um, wild pigs in Michigan, I don't know if we know that answer, but given of what uh, we're finding in just all of our uh, initial surveys is that I'm gonna say no, majority of pigs have parasites. Um, I think it comes with the territory, but Sarah, you're probably more qualified to answer that than I am. Yeah, I've definitely read scientific papers looking at parasites in wild boars um, and parasite infections are pretty common among um, those wild pigs. Uh, any resistance or kill, what does it say? Any resistance or kill them from pest infection? Um, I would imagine just um, through kind of survival of the fittest, um, some wild pigs probably have some resistance or resilience, which is um, resilience versus resistance. Resilience is having an infection, but being able to um, persist without any um, severe symptoms. Um, those traits would definitely be very beneficial for um, wild boars. So um, I would imagine that some have developed that. Um, however, I don't know um, how common that is in wild boars. Uh, another question from Ryan, has in-house farrowing decreased uh, parasitic load? Is parasitic load similar in all hogs once the issue is apparent? And I think between Baylor and um, Sarah, address that question. Um, we we do majority, our in-house. Yeah, we, um, again, farrow our pigs in-house, um, but the majority of our pigs do have parasites. Um, they're picking them up from the pasture. Um, however, for our um, biofumigation trial, we didn't have enough pigs that were born on site to run. We wanted to have at least 32 pigs. Um, so we bought in some um, 20 pound feeders from a conventional facility. These pigs had not been um, exposed to pasture in any way before. So they came in without a parasite infection. Um, but after being on our pastures, they now all have parasites. Um, so um, I think the point is once you have it in your soil or on your your farm where you're going to be having pigs, parasites are probably going to stay. They're going to stick around as long as the pigs are going to be there. Um, and the parasitic load being similar among all hogs, um, the parasitic load definitely varies greatly between pigs, um, even within a group, within a litter. Um, some pigs have much heavier infections than others, and um, some pigs become symptomatic um, with a lower infection than an asymptomatic pig. Um, so like we mentioned earlier, um, we're definitely interested in what causes these differences in infection and um, the differences in um, presentation of symptoms, but at this point we don't have um, a concrete answer for that. Okay, um, anonymous. Do you think the lack of eggs in the fields that were inoculated with fresh manure was due to the population of eggs being too low or to the uh, effects of the biofumigant? I'll address that. Um, I think it was the methodology is what I'm gonna predict. And we were using a rototiller. We've now transitioned to a spader that keeps the soil intact. So our plot sizes were also very small. They were just a square meter, I believe it was. And it was a lot of feces that they had put down. But when you use a rototiller, that's gonna move the soil uh, in your field. Uh, it's not much, but it could move all that soil to, um, you know, just outside that square meter. The spader we use now keeps the soil in place and doesn't move it. It's uh, basically taking a shovel and just sending a shovel into the soil rather than a rotary blade. That's what I predict happened in that situation. Um, I can't say it was because of the biofumigant. We have no uh, evidence to suggest that because our control, we didn't detect in the clover plots. We didn't detect any parasites uh, in those plots either. So it was basically no detection anywhere. Where did the eggs go? 
um, maybe just outside of our sampling area. It's hard to say. Anything you want to add to that? No, I think that covered it. And so uh, with our uh, objective four, where I mentioned uh, we're, we're doing this in the field with, with the pigs, um, objective four, we have larger test plots, obviously, because it's the paddocks uh, with pigs. And um, we're doing the larger, I guess, mechanical incorporation of, of the, um, the soil and the feces that are deposited there by the pigs. Anything um, you guys want to add? Um, yeah, to that, I just want to add, um, it certainly wasn't that we uh, introduced too low of a number of parasite eggs. Um, we measured um, the feces that we were going to spread to get an average eggs per gram of feces. And um, we were releasing hundreds of thousands of eggs in that small square meter. Um, so it definitely wasn't that there weren't enough. It was just that, um, or I believe that it was just that uh, they didn't stay within that one meter. Oh, uh, other thing to note with that uh, protocols, sampling protocols, we only measure five centimeters into the soil. The rototiller could have, well, you would think that it would be mixing it all up, but maybe it's burying it um, below the five meters that we're, or five centimeters that we're sampling. I think this conversation also brings up a common um, possible remediation of high parasite loads in soil, which is actually tilling the ground, um, which is something that's recommended for organic um, pasture-based hog facilities. So that is an option, and in a way, we just demonstrated that as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, well, for the gang here, uh, I don't see any more questions. Um, if there's no more questions, we are reaching the uh, close to the top of the hour. And um, let's, I, I guess we could sign off. Um, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, really appreciate it. And please check back uh, next year when we give our presentation. Uh, we'll give you some more updates on our swine parasite research. Thank you.